Hi, I'm Ivor Forsling, and this is the Permanent Rain Press. Welcome. Hi everyone, it's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press, and today I am so happy to be joined by Ivor Forsling. How are you? Ah, uh, I'm fantastic. Wonderful to be here. I'm so excited to be chatting with you and diving into Young Royals. But before we do that, let's cycle back, talk a bit about your your start in the arts. I know you started acting like five, six years old, but do you remember when you were that young, that initial moment where you said to your family, you know, I really want to perform and, and do this for a while? Um, maybe not that specifically. I mean, I think there have been like several points during my uh, childhood and life where I realized like, you know, I want to do this uh, as a living. But when I was young, I lived in London when I was like three, four, five something. Uh, and at the school I attended to, they had like a, a spring show every year where they put up, you know, a place like Robin Hood or Carmen or, or, or things like that. Um, and then I remember one year, they were doing Robin Hood and, you know, uh, all the old students, they played like the, the talking uh, roles. And we, we small kids, we had like, you know, one number where we came in and waved with some flowers and sang a song, you know. Um, but then in the end of the Robin Hood story, the uh, King George comes back and, you know, he tells uh, Sir John off uh, and fixes everything. And that is a very small role, but it's a role with a very high status. Uh, and nobody in the ninth grade wanted to play him because he was so, uh, he, had, he only had like three lines. So then they asked me for some reason, and I was, you know, so short and they were this tall. Uh, and I remember there, because I was, you know, always like showing off uh, and being like a, a drama kid. And at that time, I remember, wow, this was so fun. Uh, and then it kind of just sweeped on from that point. Uh, that would be the short answer. <laughs> it's really nice to look back on those memories because you said oh, it's not super specific, but I mean, it was a role that you had that kind of set that trajectory for you. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I, I do think back at it and, I, I'm, and I'm just, whoa, yeah, that's how it started, kind of, because now you're here and you're focusing on what you're doing now. But it's always in interesting to do a re re what do you call it? Retrospective? Yeah, uh, like retrospective, yeah, looking back. <laughs> so you mentioned being a drama kid. You do have a background in improv and theater. And I know you just graduated uh, last spring, so congratulations. Oh, wow. Thank you. Tell me about your, your studies at Performing Arts School and what you took away from your program there. Yeah, those were like the three most important years of my life, if you, if you uh, take the acting into consider consideration. Um, so I studied at, at, at a, a, an acting university here in Sweden, in the northern parts of Sweden. Uh, um, you could say that we had like five basic subjects in school. Uh, one was like acting in general. Uh, one was voice work. Uh, one was movement. One was singing. And the fourth or the fifth uh, subject was like a kind of reflection slash theater theory subject. Uh, so those were the base subjects. And then Underneath them, we had like courses and uh, workshops, and then of course longer, like uh, longer courses, who we work with like continuously during the, the three years. Um, and I really, really enjoyed being there. Um, but the interesting thing with with uh, at least my education is that you think that it's going to be the teachers and you know the subjects that are going to teach you the most, and of course they do a lot. But it is the classmates who teaches you the most, actually. Uh, because you are working with each other in the space, uh, physically, mentally, every day for three years, uh, and you see each other grow, you see, you know, all those things teaches you loads. Uh, and I'm so thankful for that. They actually mean very much to me. I think it's uh, nice that you mentioned that because I was going to say, yeah, you had the same class for three years. So getting to see each other grow and now you can support and champion one another in, in your bright careers. Um, what was your favorite performance to take part in with this group at school? Oh, uh, that must be our final production uh, or exam production, actually. It's kind of our final tests or final essay, but we do a, a show instead. Uh, or a production. And that was 
because sometimes when when you make a final production uh, at an acting university you try to choose a play you know where everybody should have like equally much to do and it could be like one person comes in and have a monologue and then out and then somebody else comes in and have a dialogue and then out it almost becomes like a, a presentation you know like okay here's these people uh, look at them as a uh, commercial everybody in the in the business can see uh, choose pick who, who they like and not but we thought, no, we really want to do a good production, a good story, and something that we do as a group. The, co the, the, the collect, do you say collective in yeah, English? Yeah, collective, yep. Collective, yeah, like the collective part of the production was very important for us. So together with our director, we chose uh, a German play um, by a German playwright. I don't know how to say his name in English, but his name is Roland Schimmelfennisch. Um, and he writes things that are very like mosaic-ish and they are like very, uh, how do you say that in English? They are very like uh, mixed up, uh, mixed around. It's not like a chronological, uh, classical dramatur dramaturgical story. Um, and that, choosing that kind of script put a lot of pressure on us, on us as a group to act very much, much as a group and not as individuals. Uh, and doing that was a magical experience. It was so hard, so challenging, but also super fun. And we could use a lot of things that we learned, but we just melted together as one unity as a group. And also when people came and watched the production, a lot of people said, it was so interesting to see that you guys worked and danced as one big group. And that made the individuals stand out even more instead of going from the other way that I talked about earlier, like doing one monologue for one person, one monologue for one person, you know. So that was a magical thing. And then of course, also, as you mentioned, you know, growing as a group, the nostalgical uh, thing that like, we have been here for three years now, we're doing a final production. Yes, we're done, we did, we did it. Uh, so yeah, that was, I, I would choose that. Collaborative process, right? That's where you kind of win as a group. You win together. Um, I'm glad you got to experience that, and hopefully have more reunions down the road. Maybe you'll get to to act and perform with them on on stages in the future. Yeah, and and that is so wonderful. I mean, Sweden is a big country when it comes to culture because we have a lot of culture and theaters and so on. But of course, it's a small country and a small world. Of course, working with acting, so so you know a lot of people, and uh, most of them are your friends. And and that is a wonderful thing that you know. I've already worked with one one classmate, uh, and I'm going to work with another schoolmate at least uh, this uh, fall. So I mean, it's fantastic. You mentioned music as kind of one of the subjects. Uh, there's also like interpretive dance. I saw on Vimeo, you did that. So did all these different aspects of the arts just come naturally to you or did you have to you know, work on one more than the other? Do you have a favorite? Oh, interesting question. I mean, from the childhood, it was always like theater who was the word that spin around in my head um, and then I have been attending like piano lessons from a pretty early age. So that came there. Uh, and I also attended some singing lessons with my piano teacher when I was in my teens. Uh, but then I didn't think that much about, you know, that, that could be something that could, could be mixed into uh, stage art or film or acting. Uh, I saw that as more of a separate thing at that point. Uh, but now, as I'm getting older, uh, I am really appreciating when uh, a stage performance or a movie or an exhibition or whatever really like mixes up different arts, uh, different forms of art, uh, you know, and also that you can express yourself from an acting point of view through, for example, an instrument or uh, the singing voice. Um, so maybe I'm not like having the goal to sing as Michael Jackson or Britney Spears. Uh, but, but what I'm aiming for is to be able to express myself through the singing voice uh, in a story with like the acting as my biggest priority and maybe not singing the most beautiful as my biggest priority. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's always, I think, healthy to stay curious as an artist because you want these different kinds of experiences. Mm, yeah, I agree. And then I've all, always been very interested when it comes to like acting 
with the physical acting uh, and movement. And that doesn't always have to mean like, now we're doing a specific dance show or we're, we're doing a specific circus show. I like to like mix them up. So do like, I've been playing quite a lot uh, of, of the children's theater uh, the last three, four years. Uh, and it's pretty common, at least in Sweden, that we like use a lot of movement and a lot of physical things. And, you know, it could be mime and stuff like that. It, 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 you can express so much with your body, uh, not only limit yourself to the text, you know, uh, as an actor, but let the text and let your intentions flow out in all your body and, you know, make expressions that aren't always like naturalistic, uh, but they can really make, make something extra. And yeah, I like, I like that very much. How many times have you put on like a clown persona or a mime persona? Uh, we we had uh, um, I've had two clown workshops in my life. Uh, one when I, I went to my like preparation education before I I went to university, and then one at, at the acting university. Um, so I've done that quite a lot of times, uh, and it's super fun, but also very 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 important as uh, or important. Uh, what's the word? Uh, it's a good lesson for an actor to work with the clown technique because. It makes you very like vulnerable. It makes you very like naked in a way, very like open uh, and very connected to the audience. Um, so I've done that a couple of times. And then mine, uh, perhaps not in my persona, but on my uh, preparation education, we, that was an education that focused a lot on the physical theater. Uh, so uh, we had mine as one of our main subjects that we, um, we had once a week. So, uh, yeah, been doing quite a lot of mime for being a normal actor, so to say, but but uh, haven't really had the mime persona, you know, with the, the makeup and the, the little hat and the striped t-shirt and the, you know, white um, gloves. You're already doing it, so it's got to happen. It's got to happen one day, right? Yeah, probably. Probably. I think so, too. Let's talk about the show now, Young Royals, where you star as Prince Eric. Tell me a bit about him and were there any specific details that you spoke about with the writers that didn't make it into the show? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I never spoke with the writers about Eric, but I, I spoke with, uh, with the directors about Eric, of course. Uh, and we, we had conversations before we started to, uh, to film. Uh, about who he was and uh, you know his um, uh, his place in the story, um, but I see Eric in one way. I have actually collected quite a lot for myself. You know, I, I think that he is a pretty like person who who uh, feels that duty is important. Uh, he's trying to be respectful to everybody he meets, uh, but then of course he also has darkness inside of him and he also has uh, anxiety and worries uh, and stuff like that then of course in the uh, in the young royal series uh, his uh, darkness perhaps isn't something that should or didn't take that much place of the simple reason that the story focuses on Wilhelm and Simon and that is how it's supposed to be um, but that was one thing that I actually spoke with with the directors about that perhaps didn't make it into the, the series that we spoke about uh, the, the car accident. And if it was an accident or if it was something that he did on, on, uh, on intention himself, uh, because of course you can discuss like Eric is also a person who uh, has been born into the monarchy. He is a person who has to be uh, the, the role that he is. Um, but of course, he is also a person who loves freedom and loves to do things that he wants to do. And we discussed a lot, of course, uh, me and the directors, that the car driving was Eric's way of feeling freedom. Driving very fast with a fast car, feeling the wind blowing, you know, feeling that you're free, you're out in the nature, out in the world. Um, and I mean, one way of seeing it is that perhaps he, I mean, now I've, I've said major spoilers. I, I realize that now, but... I suppose people who are watching this maybe have watched the series, so yeah. Yeah, we're, we'll put a disclaimer um, in the video description because we have been talking a lot of spoilers. Um, that's really interesting what you mentioned, and we'll get into those events. Uh, how, do you know how old Eric is supposed to be in the show? 
Yes, not that much older than Wilhelm. I think he's supposed to be around 20, 21, something like that. Yeah, so three, four years older than Wilhelm. Tell me, did you discuss what his childhood was like and um, Eric and Wilhelm's relationship growing up? Uh, we talked about that, I think. Uh, but, but what I was thinking myself was that I think they had a pretty classical uh, big and little brother relationship. Um, I mean, that Wilhelm probably was the one who like always was, no, I mean, Eric was the one who always was like, you know, logical and, you know, shared a, a birthday cake like a, in half. So everybody gets a equally big piece, you know, but also the one who like took care of Wilhelm if he fell, you know, and, and uh, started to cry. He came, you know, and uh, comforted him and all that. Uh, and then I can't answer for Wilhelm. I mean, that, that's Edwin's uh, thoughts, but my guess is that I suppose that Wilhelm was more of a like, uh, what should I say, a wild kid, you know. Impulsive, right? yeah. Impulsive, yeah, climbing in trees, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then because also there, there's a scene that we filmed that uh, didn't make it into the series uh, where Wilhelm and Eric uh, Eric comes into Wilhelm's room and he's sitting and playing video games just before they are taking the car to Hillerstadt. So it's just in the beginning of the series. Um, and then uh, Eric comes in with, uh, you actually see that later on in the series that Wil Wilhelm has like a glass kind of, uh, what do you say? Glass capole-ish thing with a little frog in with a crown on. Uh, and in that scene, that uh, is cut out. Uh, Eric comes with this and gives it to Wilhelm because uh, that was something that Wilhelm always wanted to have from Eric when he was a kid, but it was Eric's because he got it from their grandmother or something, I think. Uh, so, so that also, uh, that scene, even though it didn't make it to the series, I think that describes their relationship pretty well that, you know, he comes, he gives him that thing that he always wanted from him when he was a little kid. Um, so yeah, kind of like that. Thank you for sharing that. Will um, looks at it in his room, but we don't know that it comes from Eric. So I think that's like a special detail. Yes, the object exists. And of course, I mean, since the scene is cut out, uh, every viewer's imagination is of course the correct answer. I mean, we, we, I say of course that it comes from Eric, but it could come from anywhere since it's cut out from the series. We don't know that, so to say, uh, but yeah. Uh, that was the, the main intention, at least. Did you do any research yourself into the monarchy and just the, the public scrutiny that a lot of uh, political or public figures face being in the spotlight? It's an interesting question because usually I'm a very nerdy person as an actor when I do my preparations. Uh, I love to, you know, Google and read and, and have as much information as possible before I do something. Um, and I mean, especially now when uh, the character that I played, I mean, of course, Eric doesn't exist in real life, but I mean, we have a Swedish monarchy with the kings and queens and princes and princesses. Uh, so I had a golden opportunity, you know, but for some reason, I felt that that wasn't my main focus when creating the, 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 the portrayal of Eric. Uh, because for me, when I read the script and when I was like thinking in my preparational phase, for me, it was so much more important with the relationship between him and Wilhelm. And of course, I mean, I discussed with the directors that it was important that Eric had like two sides, that he was like more uh, polite and, you know, not polite, but how should I put it? Uh, more like an official version of himself when he's out in the public, so to say. And then that he was a very normal brother uh, ish person when he was in like a closed private room with Wilhelm. Uh, so that of course is something that is a research thing, but of course I didn't, I didn't ask or, or read about a real um, uh, royal person doing that. Uh, but, but apart from that, I mean, I felt that it was so much more important to just focus on the relationship between Eric and Wilhelm and uh, all the emotional things there. Uh, and yeah, it was basically not that important for me that it was two royal persons. And I think that is also why perhaps the audience have uh, interpreted their relationship as very, very familiar and brotherly, so to say. 
um, because that was my intention all along, that no matter who you are, if your family, your family, uh, you're, you're just a person. Um, and I mean, then the environments and the costumes and, and all that created the royal feeling, so to say, by itself. But so, yeah, no, I actually haven't done that much research at all uh, on the royal family and so on. What I did do, though, though, was that we, me and Edvin and the directors, we watched like a YouTube clip of the Swedish royal family when they are going to have like a photography session, I think. And it's the whole big family, you know, and they have a lot of kids and it's a dog. And then one kid just runs away, you know, and starts screaming and crying. And that kid is only like two, three years old. And you just see how everybody, they're trying to, you know, stay like public and, you know, but it's a chaos. And that was something that inspired us a lot that, you know, they are supposed to be like this, but they're also like only human beings and things can happen. As somebody poops in their diapers, they have to, you know, fix that. Um, so yeah, long answer, but yeah. That was kind of worked into the show with the running up the hill, um, which leads me to my next question. What was your favorite scene to be a part of? Mm, I actually think that my favorite scene of being a part of, if I'm talking from the perspective of how it felt when I was there shooting it, uh, was actually when we were driving, when Eric is driving Wilhelm to, to Hillishka, uh, because it was so fun to sit in that Ferrari car uh, and, Unfortunately, I didn't drive it for real, spoiler. Uh, it was put on a trailer uh, and then it was pulled by another car. Uh, but it was, it was a fantastic feeling sitting there, uh, fake driving, feeling the wind, you know, just like Eric probably feels. He loves the freedom of driving that car. Uh, and then that was also a scene that was cut out uh, that didn't make it to the, to the show. Uh, during the car um, trip, uh, Eric and Wilhelm has a, a short conversation and there's all, they're all also singing uh, one of Eric's favorite songs, uh, which is Remember by St. Abose, that is, is the song that Simon and the Choir sings at Hillerska after Eric's um, funeral. So that is also like a little funny Easter egg for you guys, uh, that uh, that is where that song comes from initially, even though we don't get to see it in the series. Um, so we were like, you know, sitting there screaming our lung, the, to the top of our lungs, that song, you know, it was a wonderful day shooting. This footage has to make it in some kind of B-roll um, release because you're leaving all these important Easter eggs that I think uh, would have been nice to include. So hopefully um, we do get to see them. But I think it's beautiful that you and Edvin kind of built Eric and Willem's relationship over such small scenes of you together. But it really felt like, you know, you had built that brotherhood and relationship for years. Um, I'll talk about a few of my favorite scenes kind of that you were in so you can provide some more behind the scenes insights. You mentioned that you uh, almost started crying when Omar sang It Takes a Fool to Remain Sane, that Halerska choir scene. Tell me a bit about filming that one. Yeah, well, the thing is, um when they filmed that the first uh angle so to say was uh, the angle on me and uh wilhelm and august when we're sitting there on the bench um and then i remember uh we started uh, shooting and then uh, simon uh, or uh, omar and the choir started singing and the camera was so close to my face and you know eric as a royal representative in the public space is not supposed to cry uh, when when somebody sings a song, he's supposed to sit there, you know, be polite, smile a little. Uh, but then Ivar uh, or Ivar, me inside, was so touched by the song because it was so beautiful, and you know, it was a cappella and it was all those uh, different harmonies. Uh, and in the church with that uh, acoustical, what do you say, acoustic? Do you say acoustic in English? Yeah. Uh, and it was very much that just touched my soul. So I really had to sit there and like hold hold the tears inside. And then when they moved the angle, so they put the cameras, so they filmed on, on Omar and the choir, uh, then I actually let a little tear out. <laughs> and I also looked to my right, because to my right, um, uh, Ingela Olsson, the actress who plays the, um, the headmaster of this Hilishka school, she was sitting on my right uh, on the different, on the other side of the hallway, so to say, 
Uh, and we looked at each other and both had like a little tear, you know, coming down. I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. Uh, yeah. It was a beautiful performance. And I like that there was like that mutual understanding that, you know, this is special. Um, how many takes did, did that one? How many takes we had to do? Oh, I don't remember specifically, but probably more than on a usual take since it was like a big room and a lot of angles to cover. Uh, and so to say, I think we were in that church all day actually uh, doing, because there's also, you know, the scenes afterwards there when, when uh, August and Nils and Vincent talks to, um, talks, to, uh, talks to Simon when he walks by, asking him to buy booze. Um, you know, it's a funny thing, but just uh, this is a sidetrack, um, that uh, the actor who plays Nils is called Samuel, right? But then the actor who plays Vincent is named Nils. Uh, and they're both friends of mine. And you know, I get confused when I'm going to talk about them in, in relationship to Young Royals, because I'm like, who's who? Because it's Nils and Samuel and Simon, you know, the, the names just mixes up in my head. Uh, but yeah, it, it took a couple of, a couple of uh, takes to take that scene. Yeah, you have to like reprogram your, rewire your brain, your like character, actor, character, actor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then also, I mean, even though I have worked with this series, I can sometimes be like, wait a second, what was the name of my character? You know, uh, I, I tend to forget since it was a couple of uh, months ago that we that we shot the, the series. And I mean, now you have your brain in something totally else. Uh, so, yeah. I really want to see that photo uh, that was taken outside Halerska with Eric Wilhelm and August. Does that photo exist or was it only like prop shot? I think they did because uh, during those uh, or during at least sometimes during uh, the shooting, they took photographs uh, in case of, you know, hanging them on walls or, or if they if if it would if they would have to be props, you know, uh, in, in a scene or something. But I think they took a photo. Uh, I think so, I'm not sure. I think you need a copy of it. It's like an awkward family photo because I know that Willem was going through a lot, but you could see his face and he could, he like could barely crack a smile there. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that would be a nice thing to have like as a memory from uh, from the, yeah. I'll send, a, I'll send an email, see if I can find it. <laughs> you need to email production on that one. Yeah, have to do. Tell me about uh, Edvin's bear hugs from behind. That was uh, a really special scene between the two of you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean that one when, when I leave him um, at the Hillerska, yeah. Uh, the interesting thing with that one, that of course we took uh, uh, several takes and several angles, but the first time we did that in that form that we hugged each other like that um it was interesting because i remember it was rosta who um who uh who directed that scene uh and she did uh, she gave me and uh, edvin uh, separate uh, directions so she took like you know edvin whispered something in his ear and then she took me and whispered something in my ear uh and i think she whispered to me something in the style of uh, you really have to go now, you know, give him a hug, but then uh, you, you really have to go. Uh, and then to Edvin, she whispered something like, hug him and don't let go. Uh, so it was a surprise for both of us, like in the situation, uh, the, first, uh, the first shot, uh, which I really liked because it got a very like genuine feel to it. Uh, um, and it was a very nice thing to shoot because, you know, you really, or I at least really felt like, wow, this is a little brother and a big brother who loves each other very much. Uh, so yeah, it, it, was, it was wonderful. I'm sure it was difficult to shoot, but um, thanks for that insight on Roshta and you know how she told you different cues because it makes it feel like you don't know what to expect you know, going in. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned on Instagram that you didn't think that Eric knew Wilhelm was, we'll say, gay or fluid, but during that last phone conversation, he understood. Could you expand a bit more upon that and, and where the indications may have been for him? Sure. Um, well, I think that 
it's of several reasons that Eric uh, may have like thought that during that phone call. Uh, one of them is just, you know, gut feeling uh, that you know someone very well, as Eric knows Wilhelm very well. Uh, and he just feels, he just feels it. Uh, uh, because I can also, when I'm watching the scene, I can almost see that it's something with like, something in the eyes and something in the feeling like, mm, there's something here. And I think I know what it is. You know, a gut feeling that you can, that you can have sometimes. But then I also think that um, Wilhelm, at least as I've interpreted it, uh, is that he's very, very open with his thoughts. Uh, when it is something, he just stands up and says it. Uh, and I think he did that during the childhood of Eric and Wilhelm uh, when they were home, like, uh, oh, wow, well, I was out doing this and now I want to do that and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but during this phone call, Wilhelm is very, like, you know, restrained and like, mm, oh, I don't know if I want to say something. So I think that is also something that makes Eric think if it would have just have been an ordinary girl, so to say, um, he would just say, well, you know, I'm dating, dating this girl and, you know, ah, I don't want to blah, blah, blah. Uh, but since it's something very special there, I think Eric really feels that, ah, okay. He can, all, he can see that it's something he wants to keep a secret, of course, because maybe you don't, don't want to tell your big brother everything about your dating life, uh, but also that it is, you know, a little embarrassing and, uh, and a secret. So, so I think that's the reason as well. And then of course, I also think that it could be Wilhelm hasn't had, at least, I think uh, the, the writer Lisa has, has said that, but maybe I've made it up, that Wilhelm hasn't had any like loves or, or, or dating uh, persons before Simon. Uh, and of course, it's not strange to not have had that when you're 17, not at all, but maybe that also could be something for Eric, you know, that why haven't like Wilhelm dated somebody or, you know, done something with someone sometime and now something happens. So, you know, maybe he thinks, okay, it's a secret that he has had, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, those three things. I think what you mentioned perfectly, like that guardedness that, that Wilhelm had during that conversation. Um, now, if there is a second season, what would you like to see from this group and specifically with Wilhelm and the royal family? Ooh, tricky question. Um, I, of course, I would like to see more of, of, of Simon and Wilhelm because they are the characters that we've gotten to know. And since they're so young, they have loads of more to explore in their identities and their lives. And of course, I, uh, as well as the rest of the world audience, probably felt pretty left after the last scene, that like, okay, this could be more. Um, so of course that. Uh, and then of course, uh, since uh, Eric is dead, um, it will be interesting to see a, a development in how Wilhelm continues to like tackle uh, the challenges with being now the royal heir. Uh, what he does with that, because now he has been focusing very much on, on just his relationship with Simon uh, in relationship to Judy and, and the crown. But it would also be interesting to see how he handles that uh, task in other situations as well, you know, other situations and, and phases of life. Um, and then it would be interesting to see more of, uh, since we don't get to see that much of the king and the queen uh, in the first season it would i think also be interesting to see like uh, more developments in who they are and their relationship between uh between them and wilhelm because now we only see their relationship between uh, the relationship between them and wilhelm in in very specific situations like uh, you've done this we have to send you away and oh eric is dead um so yeah just a general what do you say the general deepening of it would be interesting, so to say. But then August and Sara, that would be interesting as well to see more of. Uh, so I think there's a lot. Uh, you'll have to ask Lisa, say what, see what she says. Yeah, I know that the cast completely trusts the writing team. They did such a phenomenal job. 
in season one. And like you mentioned, I too would love to see the royal family grieve more together because we didn't get to see a lot of you know that process it kind of happened very suddenly and then there was the the service for Eric uh, there have been a lot of theories out there you kind of debunk them with what you said Eric is gone I think that kind of moves the the story along uh, do you think that there is space for for you to come back as this character and how would you see that happening um I don't me personally I don't think that he can come back like to life I mean then of course if if he, I mean, of course, if, if you would make something that focused more on Eric, that maybe, uh, let's say that he in secret really hated to be uh, the heir of the crown and he faked his own death and he uh, crashed the car and then blah, blah, blah. But it feels, it feels a little, how should, how should I say, how should I put it? It feels a little um, too much, you know, because since they actually buried him and all that, I suppose they found the body. I mean, you could always be like, oh, the face was burned. It was another body, but it, it feels too much. For me, it's important that the story, the story, the big story is always more important than one specific character. Uh, and I don't think that the big story and the world of young royals would like benefit on making Eric magically reappear. Um, but what, we, what, what, what you could do, of course, is flashbacks. Um, if uh, you want to like continue working on Wilhelm and you know what what he remembers from his life earlier uh, and now when he's like the heir of the crown uh, and then of course you could do if somebody would find that interesting like uh, an episode or a season or something in the future uh, about like Eric's life on Hilleshka or Eric's time growing up or, or something like that so those are like the two possibilities I see I think I, I like the flashback one. Um, I think that it would be appropriate to kind of have Wilhelm uh, doing more of his crown prince duties and responsibilities and then kind of juxtaposing that with Eric and what he went through as a young adult because I'm sure he would have been supportive of him in, in his future and his relationships. Uh, now, you are on Instagram. You recently joined Twitter, so you see how passionate and eager this fandom is. Tell me, what is this love and support meant to you? It's impossible to like summarizing words. Uh, it means the world. It's wonderful to see that people are so caring and supportive and loving. Uh, I haven't received any like, you know, bad words or, or, or hate or, you know, like uh, internet trolling. Uh, it's overwhelming. I mean, in one way, it's surreal and uh, ungraspable. And uh, on the other hand, it's just, you know, like a continuous flow of euphoria. Uh, so it, it, it is great. And I wish that I had all the time and energy to like respond every single person. I wish I could. Unfortunately, I don't because there are so many lovers out there. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to respond as many as I can, and I'm trying to, to see and read as much as I can, uh, because it means a lot to me. And it's also like insane that it has gotten like to a phenomenon level now, that it's like tattoos, TikToks, edits, fan arts, songs, Twitter, you know, it's so many things. For me, you know, it's like so unbelievable, but fantastic, of course. Uh, I. Yeah, <laughs> beyond words. That's my answer. I think a, a lot of people just like you play your part so well and they Eric was such a noble character and so respectful. Uh, I just wanted to briefly touch on what you mentioned earlier that uh, you did speak with your directors and he was dealing with maybe some internal demons that we didn't get to see explicitly. Uh, do you believe that his car accident that resulted in his passing it was an accident or was there maybe people noticed that he had a cup of maybe alcohol in his hand it wasn't that much but do you think it was genuinely an accident i actually i actually don't know i think i'm standing with like one leg in not an accident and one leg in accident because what me and the director discussed was that of course, Eric, as any other public person or, or royal person, has anxiety and worries over being who he is and not being able to choose exactly what he wants to do. 
then of course he has a very strong sense of duty. So what we discussed was that Eric is very good to contain that, keep it inside of him, but then having his car uh, driving as the way of like letting things out and being, being free. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm not sure if he was so secretly like anxious and worried and hateful about his situation that he actually would do that. One thing in me says that it was, it, of course he had those thoughts, but it wasn't on that level. Uh, but then on, on the other hand, it's not also that uncommon that people can present themselves very like calm and happy and you know, but on the inside it storms uh, and they do something like that, like uh, uh, driving yourself to, to death with, with a car. So, so I, I don't really know. And I also like that I don't know because that really like leaves an open space for different interpretations. Um, and that's why I also like that it wasn't like a scene where you saw the crash or a scene where you were in the hospital. That is like a spot that was left for all the viewers imagination and making their own interpretations. And that's something that I love in general with art when the audience gets spaces to do their own choices uh so yeah yeah that ambiguity i think leaving it open like you mentioned it kind of leaves space for you to think about it and especially you know heading into hopefully a, a second season to to explore more of that impact now on a lighter note we'll go back to twitter so before uh, we had already set this interview up but there have been people asking us to speak with you one of them will give her a shout out m who i think her twitter says that she is your official representative uh so <laughs> You don't have to pay for a publicist anymore. These people are just hyping you up and, and being supportive all the time. I thank all the gods that exist and uh, everybody else and them. It's wonderful. So we will go through a, a fun thread on Twitter that I found. Um, so it's comparing you as dogs. So yeah. I'll kind of give you the floor to uh, explain what's going on in some of these photos. I think there's like 19 of them. So we won't get to go through each one specifically, but you can kind of talk a bit about it, how you would rate the comparisons. I think it's, it's, it's such a funny idea. Who came up with this idea? I mean, <laughs> oh, Jesus. What I like with them the most is that they really have found dogs who like have the same facial expressions. It's not only like, okay, this is like the angle or the light or the, the setting in the picture. It's also the facial expressions. So we'll go through like, I guess the first one. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty accurate. He's looking in the exact same direction as the dog. Yeah. <laughs> and also like the same colors in the fur of the dog as the costume that Eric wears or the suit. Uh, yeah, I got. I love the second one as well because that is not all, all, all. That is not only the facial expressions. It's also like I remember being very happy when that photo was taken, and that dog looks so happy. It looks like it enjoys life more than I don't know <laughs> the sun. The the fifth one, the eyes eyes closed. They're yeah. both in like a forested area. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, that is like, how, who did, who had, the, who had the time to do this? Who found, how do you Google that? Dog who closes their eyes and smirks a little with a yellow scarf. Because also, like, the scarf has the same color as my, uh, as my sweater. Okay, the eye patch one. What's going on in your photo? I imagine this is some kind of play or production. <laughs> Yes, it is a production. Uh, it was a production that I did, uh, the, the final production on my preparation education. And then we did a Pinocchio. Um, and in Pinocchio, at least that version, there's loads of different characters. Uh, so that was one character that I played that I think the name of it, of it was like the Animal Keeper. Um, so yeah, it's a... But <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Dogs having a party too. Dogs having a party, yeah. Uh, okay, what's going on in the neck, the yellow jacket? Oh yeah, that was actually when I had a party when I was like 
19 or something uh, because I love the band The Queen very much. Uh, so I dressed up as Freddie Mercury uh, and uh, tried to like react the pose that he does on, I think it's like Wembley Stadium or something, 1986-ish. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on. <laughs> dog in yellow jacket even the the clasps are like the same too which is insane yeah. how did they maybe somebody's very good at photoshop it's like photoshopped all those things in yeah i i also think it's very funny to like watch only the pictures of me because it gets me to think like wait what is this from when and how did people find this uh, they are but, internet sleuths i tell you obviously uh which is fantastic i mean if i ever l lose something i want to find it i will ask twitter and they'll find it the split second okay the comb over hairstyle oh yeah 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 wow oh <laughs> that is also the funny thing with that one is that that picture is from i i was like connected to a modeling agency for a couple of years uh, but only connected to them. I never like did any jobs or something. Uh, I was just in their catalog, so to say. But that picture is from like um, the only thing that I did. And I, it wasn't even a paid job. And I just realized that I have, uh, I'm afraid of, you know, that facial expression that you're supposed to have if you're a model, you know, the, that brooding look. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I get like, um, uh, I get stressed because I'm, I'm not sure how to do it. Some people have that so natural, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's a funny dog picture as well. How <laughs> The black and white on the, the chair. Yeah. It's funny you're doing that look again. Did, you, did that one feel more natural? Yeah, I think that one felt more natural because then I was doing a, a, a portfolio photo shoot like for uh, just for my uh, private portfolio acting portfolio. Um, so I didn't feel the pressure then that this picture is going to be used in a magazine or a commercial or something. Um, and I was like with a photographer that I feel very um, safe with. So uh, yeah. <laughs> same chair, the dog's like on the same chair. That's exactly. great. It's the same chair. Wow. I actually, uh, the dog uh, inspires me. I should have worn sunglasses on that picture i realize that now but <laughs> missed opportunity next time around yeah, 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 yeah the pride okay that's a good one that's a good one as well oh wow the last one is really the one where like because that's a picture from a performance uh and i look very like intense in my facial expression but that dog looks i don't know triple the intensity in the, in the facial expression. <laughs> That's a really good one to end things off on there, right? We should show the, show the, here. Oh yeah, the I'll put them on the screen so people can oh. see what you're talking oh. about, yeah. Good, somebody has a good, good technical uh, tools. I don't, so that's good that you know that. That's such a great thread. It is, I love it, I love it. I'm going to save it for all my life. Now, you were at the first promotional event for Young Royals, like the one where they had Omar and the choir sing uh, on yeah. the streets of Sweden. What was it like being there with, with Rosta and Lisa and, and Edvin and kind of just seeing it all come together? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of emotional because, uh, you know, as I said, I cried almost to that song on set and then that song came again and you know through music you really feel like unity and all that and we stood there and you know yeah it just felt like right we did it good job everybody um, and yeah it was it was a magical little moment uh, and it was also fun to see that people who wanted to like come and take pictures and uh, want to see uh, the people who work for the show or just uh, have a conversation or, or ask a question. It was a great meeting space, so to say. So uh, yeah, that was really nice. That was going to be my question. Did you shed more tears now that it, you were you were Ivor and not in character as Eric? 
Oh yeah. Actually, I didn't shed tears that day for some reason. I don't know why. I, I also think it, because I was more happy, happy, you know. Yeah, you're excited to, to yeah, be there. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I sometimes cry tears of joy and happiness as well. But that day was more of like, you know, so, so yeah, I, I don't remember any tears shed that day. Now, with the show, having fluid LGBTQ representation and honest storylines are so important. You know, what did being a part of this project teach you as a person? One thing that came to my mind was that, of course, uh, we who created the series uh, all knew that uh, this was like a story between two uh, men who loves each other, uh, or boys, uh, but, you know. Um, we know what the themes are in the story and that they are like uh, going outside the norms and uh, all, all those things. But one thing that I also thought about when we were shooting the series and when I was watching the series is that some things are also just created without comments, if you understand what I mean. Like when I watched the sex scene between Wilhelm and Simon, I totally forgot about their sexes. Do you, you know, I, the only thing I saw was two people loving each other very, very much. Uh, and I got that feeling several times when watching the series that, you know, this is just two people loving each other. Then if somebody had uh, a female, if, if it was a female or a male or what sexual identity they had, you know, that kind of just went outside what I saw. Uh, but then, of course, some of the things should be very commented as they are, because it's still uh, uh, the LG LGBTQ plus people don't aren't entitled to the rights that they are should be entitled to yet in the world. Uh, but what I learned about that was that it's also important to portray uh, those uh, kind of themes as genuine as you can. And not only doing like, okay, now we're doing a gay scene or a gay movie, it has to be like this. We have to do those classical gay things. Uh, so I taught, I, I, I learned a lot about that. Um, and then of course I learned loads about, you know, acting and being on a movie set and working in that environment. And, uh, and so to say, since I've been doing most stage theater uh, in my life and uh, filming movie or series is something pretty new to me. Um, so learn a lot about that of course. I think a lot of people have been going on social media and saying how validating this show was for them um, specifically with characters Willem, uh, Sara with her Asperger's and Asperger's yeah. people on the spectrum so I think it's it's special to have that unique bond and it will continue having this impact as it reaches more people. Uh, now for you as an actor where do you see yourself in five ten years time are there any specific character types or genres that you would like to explore more of? That's a big question. Um, I would say that where I am right now, I, you know, I've just graduated my education and so so on. Uh, and right now, I feel very like open-minded. Uh, I have a very broad perspective on, on what, what I want to do. Uh, so I feel that you know everything that's new that I haven't tried before feels fun. Uh, most things feels fun. Uh, so I'm just trying to be very like broad in how I look on my work right now and through working, find out what I like. Just, you know, take jobs, try things, uh, try this, try that. Uh, and through that, uh, like uh, understand what I like and what I don't like. So answering that question is, I don't think I can, but maybe I can answer it in a couple of years when I've like started to, you know, uh, have a compass in some way you know and then of course there are some things that i like more than others that i know now already but but right now i'm just i'm very open-minded so to say but i hope that i like uh still act <laughs> that's what i hope that i do in 10 years <laughs> I think that you'll be just fine. Um, you, so I guess you have experience now with like young adult drama. I know you did crime mystery with, with the series. Does that include writing and directing? Because I know that's something that you've, you've talked about, you have an interest for. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do. But then of course, right now, I feel very focused on the acting part uh, and writing and directing is something that 
I would like to explore, but I see that pretty, maybe that is like in 10 years or 15 years that uh, I start to explore that then. But also I have very, very much respect for both. Uh, I have respect for all, um, what do you say, all positions uh, within creating something, a, a movie or uh, a series or, or a theater play, but directing and writing, I mean, for me, I don't just see that I, oh, go and try it, you know, then I want to really like dig deep into it, uh, perhaps educate myself, uh, go as an assistant to, to colleagues that write or direct, uh, because I have so much respect for, for their work uh, and for what they do and their knowledge. Um, so yeah, I don't have any more like specific thoughts. It's more like, could be interesting things to explore later on, uh, yeah. I think if you uh, get the opportunity to to shadow on on future projects, that would I'm sure be a valuable experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. You said on Instagram that your special or weird talent is sounding like a sheep. Uh, would you care to demonstrate? Ah, <laughs> uh, it bites me in my ass. Okay, yeah, sure. It was quite some time now that I did it, so I'm not sure how it will sound, but I can tell you the backstory. Uh, I uh, swam or uh, like uh, swam on a like semi semi professional level when I when I uh, grew up. Um, so I was uh, at the swimming house uh, six times a week, five times a week, something. And then I had a, a friend in my group who, when we were in the shower one day, he just sounded like a sheep, and it sounded so good, you know. And, and then I asked him like Simon because his name was also Simon. Simon, what are you doing? And then he said, well, I'm sounding like a sheep. Do you want me to teach you? And I was like, yeah, sure. So here comes a demonstration of this. What you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to fold your tongue like this, uh, and then you're supposed to have like the holes there and there, and you also like have a little air there and like very like relaxed. So it feels like blobby, you know, and almost a little saliva coming, you know, like mm, into the tongue. And then it's supposed to sound something like this. This could go, okay. Um, I don't know. Does it sound like sheep? It does. That was so great. It's so much uh, more. It seems like the technique then. To me, you're just like, bah, like, right? People do that all the time, but there's so much more involved than, than just that. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, thank you. I think it sounded better when I was younger, but now you guys, you can uh, exercise at home and then we'll have uh, uh, a meet in one year and we'll see who sounds like the best. Sheep. Yeah. Sheep sound off. Sheep sound off. Exactly. Uh -huh. Because we are also a music based website. I have to ask you who are some artists you're listening to on your playlist? Ooh, uh, right now I'm listening to Melody Gardot. Um, uh, uh, that's an artist that I very recently found out uh, existed. Uh, and then I'm also listening to, I think the name of the duo or the band is Silk Sonic. It's like Bruno Mars and Anderson Park who created some kind of duo. Uh, they have some songs that are great. Uh, and then I'm always listening a lot to Queen. So that's like my ish favorite band. Um, and then I, I, I actually also listened a little to a Swedish house mafia has kind of like reunited very recently here. They released two new songs. So I listened to them uh, a little bit. So yeah, that's what's like going around right now. That's such a throwback. Like I, to me, I only remember they had, uh, was it Save the World? That was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. many years I, ago was that now? Must be 10 at least. I know, Ooh. yeah. But th that was a good song, so I'm, I'm glad they're kind of back together, I guess. Yeah, 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 me too. And our signature question for you, if you could be any ice cream flavor, which would you be and why? <laughs> I'm going to choose strawberry because it tastes good. Very simple answer. I like it. It's funny because that, I think, was your shortest answer this entire interview. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. Because now you're like, whoa, I need to cut this down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I love the conversation. And thank you so much for, for sharing your insights about your character and your background. It's really appreciated. 
Yeah, thank you to you. It's been wonderful to be here. Wonderful talking to you. For all those watching, make sure to catch Ivor in Young Royals. Season one is out now on Netflix, and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye.